Hello and welcome to Ford the Hamlet. My name is Ben and I'm joined by Hugo. Hello, good afternoon. How are you? Not too bad, thanks mate. How are you doing? Very well, the beard is looking nice and bushy as always. Thank you. <laughs> I'm also joined, joined by Danny Mills. Hi guys. Um, beard is also looking relatively bushy. Been growing it for 15 years, so this is good for me. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'm actually going to pass over to uh, Hugo to introduce this week's guest. Uh, we're on episode six now of Home Disadvantage, which is our new series. Um, and yeah, Hugo is particularly excited about this week's guest, as am I and Danny. Um, so Hugo, it's over to you. Yes, a uh, pleasure to have a forward Hamlet first, uh, first ever Dalit Hamlet women's player to ever come on the podcast. Um, She's just completed her first ever season in the UK, also the first ever season of the Dulwich Hamlet women's team. Uh, we've really enjoyed her performances on the left side uh, this season. Um, but how did you come to be in the UK? Havana, how are you doing? I'm good, Hugo. Thanks for that intro. Good to see you guys. Um, it's, been, it's been so fun. I, yeah, I came here, I'm studying here. And wasn't really like planning on on joining a team even though you know so football so I can say soccer a lot feel free to interrupt me um has just like always been such a huge part of my life and so coming out here and being able to be on a team and especially this team and this club um has been really really fun so yeah it's been it's been a great experience so far and what's your background in soccer you, you played in the states to quite a high level i understand yeah, so the I grew up, I grew up playing like you know in the park like all kids do, and then um, club soccer, and then I played um, at the University of Washington, um, and there are a lot of college teams, and definitely a lot um, from what I know of here, just like yeah yeah kind of just bigger bigger infrastructure, especially around the women's game, kind of at the developmental level. Um, so yeah, I played in college at the University of Washington for four years and then have taken a couple of years off and then came out here. And we actually have a mutual friend who played a bit of a role in getting you into the women's team. Can you maybe just tell us a little bit about how you came to join the, the team here at Dulwich? Yeah. Good old Mike. He'll love this shout out. Hey, Mike. Um, yeah, I met, I met, um, I met Michael, just a friend, um, when we were actually backpacking. Um, we were in South Africa. We met in a hostel. And um, I then a year later moved out here, got back in contact with him. And I think he grew up in Dulwich. So he brought me to my first, my first women's game. And I was like, this is pretty cool. I would love to play. Um, and so I just, I think at that point, yeah, I just like after the game went over to the fence and um, got Brit's attention, our captain, and asked if I could come try out. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the story. And then from there, I got to yeah, I got to be here. So. And there's quite a sort of American flavor to the women's team. You weren't the first Yank on the team. A lot of American flavor, yeah. There is a lot of American flavor, but it's been super. I mean, it's been so so fun. And I feel like a lot of the Americans here too have. I'm definitely the newest, the babyest American. So. Yeah, it's been good. And how have you, how have you found the whole first season um, now that we're in the off season? So fun. I'm definitely really tragic that it got cut short because we were, we were killing it. Um, but yeah, it's been awesome. Like this group of girls are just, this, this group of women are just so, so like smart and hilarious and just to be around a group of people that want to compete and just like love the sport and you know, are dedicated to getting better every day, even with all of the stuff we all have going on in our lives, respectively. Um, it's been like, the, you know, a huge part of my community being here in London. Great. Well, it's been yeah. amazing to have you on board and thank you for coming on today. Um, ben, did you want to kick us off with some questions? Yeah, I've got, um, as last week, we kicked off with a few questions that we got from our audiences because um, we want this to totally be a two-way conversation. And um, one which I think is quite interesting is uh, someone's asked, um, is it okay for me as a white person to positively discriminate and prioritize black people in my life over white people or could it be seen as patronizing? 
I can like I can see where they're coming from, um, but I'm really interested to see what the thoughts were on that. You want me to start? Is this uh, uh, anybody? Anybody? Totally open. Yeah, whoever wants to, whoever's got any like strong feelings on it, we can just. So I feel like my, I mean, my initial reaction to that question is, um, I would, yeah. I would kind of interrogate like what, you know, where does that, where does that question come from? And for me, it comes from like uh, kind of a response in this moment. I feel like, especially with everything that's going on with Black Lives Matter, this huge moment where people are kind of like, you know, it's a call to action, not just for black people to speak up, but for like non-black people and white people, especially to like, you know, figure out how they can fit into this especially now, um, and kind of like speaks to like affirmative action more broadly. Um, and I think the reaction sometimes is to be like, well, we just have to make black people the center of attention all the time now and make sure that we're just not, not um, silencing black people. But I think really more what it's about is acknowledging that there are like black people who are experts and who are at the top of their field in every single field. Um, and it's less about like, oh, I have a black friend, so I'm gonna listen to my black friend more than any of my white friends, but like, you know, appreciating and acknowledging the expertise outside of just that person being a black person, but that person being their own individual person in their own right and being like an individual and unique and, and thinking about the ways that you as an ally can like lift that up or center that because I do think you get into this dangerous territory of like being tokenized, like just because you're black, I want to hear what you have to say. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if there's a straight answer, but I think for me, whenever I hear questions like that, I, I always ask the asker to think about like, why are you even asking that question? And think about in your life, the ways that you like to be lifted up and listened to or like deferred to on things that you know a lot about. Um, for me, that's more what about like things like affirmative action or saying like, and and lifting and centering black voices in this moment, especially. Do you think that them mentioning, you know, the fact that they might f themselves feel that they are patronizing someone else, like they're almost making it about themselves again, instead of um, like you've just said, like instead of helping to lift them up and, and being an ally, there's it, maybe it's coming from a place of almost like guilt, which mm. is quite a classic um, theme in a lot of in a lot of what has been talked about recently is like white person's guilt. Mm. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, I have so I'm mixed. I have a lot of white family members, and. Um, I think my white people who are like required in a lot of ways because they're attached by blood to like be engaged in these conversations maybe more than other white people um i think you can tell you can see that sometimes really what is motivating people is this guilt of like i have to do something and i think I've had this conversation a couple of times before. I don't think, I think that if you are motivated by guilt or by shame to like, you know, hire a black person or whatever, or engage in anti-racism or be engaged in this moment, if that's what's gonna get you to do something good, but that doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the only thing that's motivating you. You could be motivated to be engaging in this fight because it matters to you that your employer or that your university or that your community is actually fair for everybody because that is important to you. You know, like, um, I think, especially in this moment, it's very likely that as a white person trying to do the right thing, you might get called out. One black person might think you're doing an awesome job. And then the next day, another black person is like, don't do that. You know, it's more about a willingness to be called out and to be called in and being comfortable with like doing the wrong thing and messing up because if you're the alternative is not doing anything and that's not really acceptable at this point, you know? So like, you know, 
racism is like hard to talk about and it's hard to engage with. Um, but I'd much rather the, you know, the white people in my life who like aren't really having given it, being given a choice right now of whether or not to engage, um, the, at the very least they're showing a willingness to like do the wrong thing and say, Hey, I did the wrong thing. I messed up there. Maybe that was, a, I was centering myself a little bit. That was more about me than it was about you. And then you move on and you learn from it on to the next, you know? And yeah, I, I totally agree. And do you think that um, if somebody does realize that they are deciding to embark on this new journey of education or, or whatever you want to call it because of guilt, would you say that, you know, don't beat yourself up about that because, you know, at least it's probably pushing you into being more proactive and considering how you can be an ally. So guilt might be the primary driving force but that actually might be okay if you then use it to not be driven by guilt. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think like at the end of the day, like, you know, as one, a black person and also as someone who's like choosing to spend a lot of time doing this work, you know, I sometimes feel like around every corner, I have to make sure that I'm letting my white friends know you know, like, keep going, keep working, keep, and that also is, like, takes time and energy, and for people I love and I care about, I'm willing to do it, but, like, you know, we were talking a little bit before this about, like, some Twitter conversations, and that stuff that, like, I, I'm really happy, like, I have, you know, you know, we can have conversations, and, and you are someone who can be an ally, and you can go spend your time reassuring white people that, um, it's okay to feel guilty and you guys got to keep going. But like, I don't really want to spend my time doing that. And I don't, you know, take me a long time to realize that's not necessarily mean. That's just me drawing a boundary. Like it's cool if you're guilty, but I'm not going to sit here and spend time reassuring you of that. Like you just got to keep going and maybe lean on other people who also feel guilty and talk about that and reflect on that meaningfully. But don't ask the black people in your life to like validate validate your guilt or validate your work, you know, cause it's like not the point. Yeah. And it's also not their responsibility. Right. 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 You go, what thoughts do you have? Uh, no, just, uh, sitting and listening really. Um, I, I think that, yeah, guilt, guilt can be a motivation, but then it, the sort of onus is on you to like, educate yourself and work through that guilt into it becoming sort of positive action. So yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting one. Um, like a fair enough question really, but what else, did, what else did you have? Um, I sort of, I echo what um, Havana said, you know, it's, um, you know, she kind of took the words right out of my mouth to, to, to be honest. Um, at the end, at the end of the day, you know, you you as like a black person, you want to be uplifted, not just because you're black. Like I said, like Havana was saying, there's a lot of black people in higher positions and doctors and lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. And the way you want to be uplifted is because of, of who you are. I've said it on many times since we've done, done this show. You, you just want to be seen as a, a member of society who is contributing. And like you said, you just want to be uplifted in a positive way. We talk about guilt and things like that. That's, that's not on us. That's, that's, that's not on us. That's not our fault. If you feel guilty, that's, that's not, that's, we can't do anything about that. But at the end of the day, uh, everything has to come from a place of being genuine as well. I've said that before with other questions. You just want people to be genuine. We spoke about uh, language, didn't we, in the last episode about using so-called black language and things like that. Um, you want people to just come from a, 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 a good place. Um, and and that's, that's all you really ask for, to be honest. Yeah, the, the language question was interesting as well. And Havana, just in case you weren't aware, we had a question last week when, um, uh, I think it was even my question, to be honest, because like, of the areas that we live in, there are a lot of, white people who've moved into London and then there's existing black communities and a lot of the time you'll get um this is a huge generalization I don't mean like everyone does this but you'll hear like white people using 
language that you'd usually associate with the black community and like black kids like particularly like that are being used at secondary schools like all over the city basically and and sometimes you hear it and it's a bit jarring and i've never i've always like wondered is that okay for me to think that that's a bit strange or and we kind of got to the point where it was like that's it's not like the language of the black community it's just the language of kids growing up in london and it just so happens that you know it's perfectly fine for kids from all backgrounds to use it and then that's is that perfectly fine for everyone from all backgrounds to use that language and i think we kind of got to the point where it, it was like that language isn't specific and isn't like the sole responsibility of one demographic because it's like speaking spanish or speaking french or does that make sense I mean, yeah, I would just add, I mean, I'm, I'm, I definitely, I didn't hear this full extent in this conversation, but whenever I, you know, conversations, what you're talking about is appropriation, essentially. And like, even, you know, after, at, over time, I think the same conversation happens in the US, like, you know, hip hop culture or like urban language, how politicians say, you know, like, you know, language and stuff that's associated with certain populations that ends up becoming like so normalized and widely used. The reason why I'm like careful in these conversations, again, I'm not like the arbiter of like black language. I'm not the rule gatekeeper. This is just my opinion. Uh, that language, when black kids use it, that's language that gets them arrested, killed, disenfranchised, not hired, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So like, you know, even if you're a white kid and you grow up speaking that way, you grow up in a black community, you grow up around black people, all your friends are black, you say that stuff. The, you know, where the race part comes into it is like, you know, we talk about code switching, you know, black people have these like two modes where like, I have my job interview, you know, whatever. I actually grew up around white people. So I just talk like this, you know? Um, but you know when people say things like well just you know it's not a specifically associated with black people it just so happens um the racism that is accompanied with that like it just so happens shows up when like that black kid who speaks the same way as that white kid won't get that job because they don't speak a certain way or because you know and that white person who speaks the same way might not get the job but they could code switch out of it and immediately step out of that, the racialized attachment that comes with speaking that way. Um, so that's where I'm like, I think appropriation is dangerous and it's a hard conversation because it's hard to sometimes connect the dots, but like white people doing things that black people get killed for or arrested for or not hired for um, is problematic in my opinion. And like something that people should think about you know, think about more critically, even if it's just how you talk, you know, definitely like talk about that. Think about that. Think about the privileges that you're attached to, the identities that are attached to you that make that use of that language different for you than for someone else. Yeah, we, we didn't, we didn't even think about that. So thank you for ex explaining that viewpoint because it's super useful. Like we, we didn't consider that at all. And I don't think any of our audience would well, probably a lot of our audience wouldn't have considered that either. Um, and it makes total sense. Um, so thank you. Um, we had um, another question, which I think is particularly interesting because of the, again, the areas that Hugo and I really live in, in, in London, um, about black owned businesses. And Hugo, I'm going to ask you first, because I think it's interesting to speak to you about it as well and get these guys to, to input. Like, do you ever feel like you don't, um, you won't go and engage with a black owned business because you might think you're not welcome or you don't want to, you don't want to basically intrude? Uh, not personally. I mean, as you've alluded to, I do live in quite a black area of London in Peckham and on Rye Lane, there are a number of black owned grocery stores and supermarkets and, I would, I do use them. I wouldn't feel uncomfortable using them, but um, is this what you think this question is sort of getting at? Yeah, I th I think it's again it kind of it kind of matches the other question in that it's like white person's guilt. Actually, it's kind of the same along the same lines. Like you don't want to be 
stepping on toes and maybe that's why you wouldn't go to the black owned business instead of a, a white owned business like um, because because in london i was as we've spoken about before there are like communities next to each other but not intersected and so you will go to a white owned grocery store instead of a black owned grocery store because that's just what your community is doing so you won't make that cross over because of various reasons and it could be because you don't want to you don't want to as i said intrude you don't want to be going somewhere where maybe you feel like you're not supposed to sure yeah i mean if they're local shops in your area i think it's good to support your local shops and i think they would probably appreciate you spending your money there to be honest but um yeah no it'd be interesting to hear some other responses to this one you see with, with this question here um like you said i think if this is a community that you live in and these are local shops, why wouldn't you go there? That's, that's sort of my, my answer to that. Why wouldn't you go there? What is the reason for you not to go and buy a loaf of bread at a shop? You can't look at it where, oh, that's a black owned shop. I might not be able to buy it. For me, it doesn't really make sense because at the end of the day, you're, you're making a, a transaction. You, you want, if you want a product, you should go and buy it. Now, I'm not saying that that person should go out of their way two, three miles out of their way just to go and support a black owned business. No. But if you've got a shop, like you were saying, Hugo, in your local area, for me, it shouldn't come down to colour. That, 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 that's a business owner. They own that business. You would like a product from that business. Go and buy it. And they're, like I said, they're a business owner. So they're not going to say, they're not going to tell you to get out because they want your custom. They want your business. Um, and that, like I said, it doesn't... I, I, I think there's this, again, it, it plays into a bit of a narrative about what people perceive black people to be like. Why would you not go into that shop? What do you think is going to happen if you walk into that shop? Um, and I just feel like people shouldn't feel any type of way about going into a black owned business. You will be welcomed with open arms, like any business, because they want your money, don't they? Everyone wants you to spend money. Doesn't matter if you're black, white, Asian, Chinese. If you're coming to buy something from there, they're going to welcome you, aren't they? So that's, that's my viewpoint on it. Yeah, and I would even go a step further than Danny and say like, yes, you should go to the black owned shop in Peckham. Yes. And you should tell all of your, and like, you should walk three miles to go spend it. You know, if you want to, if you want an easy guilt-free way to engage in this moment, spend your money on black and brown owned things. Easy. Stop shopping on Amazon. You know, like that's, that's cake. And I think especially in Peckham, like this is a way that you can, you know, it's not about like screw these white owned businesses, but like Peckham that's being rapidly gentrified, like, you know, there's a difference between like, you know, supporting, you know, supporting black owned businesses and like taking up space. That's just, you know, I think your question, Ben, that makes me think about is like, this question would be may maybe asked by a white person that doesn't want to step on toes or take up space. There's a difference between supporting a black owned shop and going into the black owned shop and being rude to the person that owns it. If you're going to do that, don't go, you know, like don't go into a, a black owned club and like be on the dance floor like this and not letting anyone else have some space in there. Like know who the space is for, but a thing like a shop, you know, or a restaurant that want your business and want your money and need it in a community that's being, has like a really cool trendy, like boba shop coming in and a cool trendy ice cream parlor and they need to compete. Like, yes, support them. Yes, hugely. If that's important to you, yes. Buy black, period. That's my opinion. I, I agree with that. I agree with that as well. Um, like I said, I think it's all about personal preference as well. Like I said, if, that, if you do honestly really want to passionately support, then of course, go and do it. But like, don't feel guilty for it or don't use that as an excuse not to go type thing. Go. Do you know what I mean? Definitely go. Yeah, again, Mills, you just used the word guilt, and I think it does come from a place of guilt. So I think maybe one of the main obstacles, barriers that some white people probably need to get over is that feeling of guilt, because it will get in the way of you actually expanding your horizons, um, which is not, not something I really considered when 
um, I kind of started dedicating more time to my own learning. I never really considered that that would actually be something that would get in the way or something that was so prevalent. I think it really is. I think I'm starting to realize that it's, it's actually a lot more of an influence than I ever would have imagined that it was. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure what to make of that. I haven't really unpacked that yet, but that is something quite interesting, which I guess you could look into a lot further. Just to add to like those shops are there because they serve a community that is in the area like they are for local people and if those local people are being kind of driven out of the area by gentrification less people are going to go to that shop so if they don't get enough business they're not going to be there forever so i think it is kind of just in a kind of local economical sense it's important to shop at your local shops and buy your groceries locally just with a kind of sustainable mindset as well. Um, I wanted to cover as well something which um, I mentioned before we started recording and it's becoming a daily occurrence now in the UK and the States as well, even though I'm not, I don't have as much visibility, visibility over that um, as I do on what happens in the UK. I'm basing this on social media. But um, it seems to be a daily occurrence that a new bit of footage will be uploaded to social media of a black person or a group of black people being harassed by the police. Um, a lot of the time it's in London. A lot of the time um, the people involved are young. A lot of the time the people are completely innocent. There's no reason for them to have been stopped. A lot of the time the police are using a tone which is incredibly aggressive from the off um, and this week it just so happened that um, one of these pieces of footage that, footage that was uploaded was of um, an elite UK athlete, um, Bianca Williams and her husband who's also an elite athlete, I think he's Portuguese, um, and their, their young child. They were pulled over in West London um, because they matched the description of some suspects who the police were looking for in the area. Um, there, was, there was no explanation by the police when they were pulled over. Um, they were asked to vacate the car. And when Bianca, um, who was filming all of this, when Bianca started um, asking why, like perfectly reasonably, she didn't get any response. She was just kept telling more and more forcibly to get out the car. Um, and then fast forward a couple of days later, after this all broke on Twitter, um, the Met Police have actually come out and apologised. They've actually issued an official apology, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Hugo and Danny, if you know, but I think that might be the first time I've ever seen the Met Police apologise just for, I say just for, and I mean this because, you know, no, you know, there wasn't a prosecution or anything or it didn't go any further than them being stopped by the side of the road but they've actually apologized for pulling someone over which i haven't i don't think i've ever really seen before but that's particularly interesting to me because i think maybe if this was six months ago or 12 months ago that wouldn't have happened but the question that i wanted to ask all of you is why why is this still happening why are black people in the uk still being racially profiled and what damage does that cause to any sort of um, progress towards greater equality in the UK? Um, I think it's very interesting because I've just got some of the information here and the officers said that there was a lot of youth violence and stabbings in the area and that the car looked very suspicious. Those are from the words of the, the officer, and I believe the car that he was driving was a Mercedes. They, they, they didn't know, clearly, that, that, that the, the, the two people in the car were elite athletes, right? So what you can obviously tell from that is that it doesn't matter whether you're Joe Bloggs on the street, whether you're an elite athlete, this is, this is still happening every single day. And the fact that they're talking about the car looks suspicious, you have a, 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 a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband or wife with their child in there. It, it makes no sense. 
what what looks suspicious you know they're just going home just trying to do their daily you know going about their daily lives and i think this this problem i said it before i've had an exact situation like that this problem has been here for years and years and years and it's still here and the fact that they've come out and apologized my thing with that and what annoys me about that is would they have apologized if that was a joe blogs on the street that's 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 my problem that's my issue if that was danny mills driving they stopped me dragged me out of the car would i have got an apology no of course i wouldn't of course i wouldn't but i think because they've been shamed in a sense and it's someone from in the public and in the media they've been forced to come out and apologize and i look at it where is the apology a good thing or is it just to say we're just apologizing because of who it is and i felt so sorry for her watching the video because i thought she's trying to go home i'm actually just trying to go home and this is what you're doing and for me i just think that there's a lot more that needs to happen it's it's institutional it's in the system it's in the system and it doesn't matter like i said if you're a lawyer you're a doctor you're just seen as a black person in a car driving looking suspicious and um yeah so like i said it's a it's a big problem it's a big problem and i looked at the apology and it didn't really do anything for me if i'm being honest because this stuff is still happening and i feel like they've been lent on to do the apology a bit of a token apology that's how i felt anyway yeah danny you yeah you said it and i think to add on to that the reason why you know like danny talked a little bit why it's still happening it's a structural problem but i think why black people still make such a big deal about this is because you know i i think every single black person regardless of their class where they grew up you know, what their per job is, they themselves have been profiled or they know someone that's been profiled. On top of that, these are the type of stops and interactions that people get killed over. And I've heard a lot that people in the UK think Black Lives Matter UK is just kind of like a response to George Floyd and a response to killings there. People die in police custody here a lot. You guys have the UK kills a lot of people. I don't have the numbers on me. 1,741 people died in police custody. This, how long? Since 1990. You know, those are, those are, that's a lot. That's a lot of people. So like these, you know, a routine traffic stop, you know, even when someone, you know, even if it's someone committing a crime, Danny, you said this, like, it's not just innocent people or people that are not looking suspicious or aren't in a bad neighborhood that deserve to not die when they get pulled over. It's like these, this is, you know, we're talking about like this, this is why we feel such a sense of urgency. People are dying. People's lives, people's loved ones are being killed all the time. And I think this also for me speaks to the power that athletes have, you know, to echo Danny, like, this apology wouldn't have happened had this person not had a platform. The power of sport and what it does is it like, athletes are seen as these apolitical beings, you know, because they represent a nation or they represent a league or a team, you know, and then all of a sudden when athletes take a political stance, you know, which in this case is my life matters, which is somehow seen as a political, you know, position, people pay attention because I guarantee you she has fans and supporters that are not thinking of this as a problem. And all of a sudden she has the power just based on who she is and what her job is to bring such a wide swath of people into the conversation. And that for me is like why there's such a huge opportunity for athletes especially to engage in this is because what i see this apology as is an invitation from the met police to hold them accountable if you're apologizing you're acknowledging that you did something wrong i want you to talk about what that is i want you to break down why that was wrong I want to break down why when you see black people engaging in knife crime, that makes you pull over another black person in a different neighborhood. That's an, that's an invitation to have a conversation. And the reason it's happening now and not 10 years ago is because of this movement. You know, like 
people are paying attention now and yeah, athletes have a huge platform. So it's kind of, for me, like I'm excited. Like I'm like, let's go. This is it. Let's move. The police are listening, you know. That's exactly it, Havana. This is what I'm, this is what I'm talking about. Why have you apologized? Why have you apologized? That's, that's exactly it. She's what not is the reason? Her. Exactly. And like Havana said, the power of sport, the power of athletes, we spoke about this a few episodes ago, the platforms that they have. And, and, it's, and it's not a good thing that she's been stopped, but it's like maybe now people will see that this just doesn't happen to, this happens to everyone. The class, status doesn't come into it. It happens to everyone. And because she's got that platform, which is a blessing, like Havana said, people will listen now. And the apology thing is exactly the same as Havana said. We, we need to, we, they need to now acknowledge what's happening and what's wrong with, within the system. You know what? I remembered after Bianca Williams um, posted the footage on social media, I remembered that in... In 2016, Dalian Atkinson, who was one of the Premier League's like, finest goal scorers in the early years of the Premier League, one of Aston Villa's greatest ever players, hugely high profile player in the Premier League in the 1990s, police were called to his house at half one in the morning in like summer 2016. Uh, by a neighbour, a neighbour phoned the police, and then two hours later he was dead. Like, they tasered him and he died. And there has been nothing from um, the local police. Is it West Mercia Police? Yeah. There's been, there's been no apology. The officers weren't even suspended from work while the investigation was going on. Um, and I remembered that this week, and and it's... It's, it's just mad to think about it. Like, if that had happened now, there's no way that there wouldn't have been any, like an apology from the West Mercy Police. And then what would follow after that when a black man had died, he'd been tasered. Like, it just reminded me of that. And it just reminded me how that was basically swept under the floor. I, did, I remember not hearing about it much in the media afterwards. Um, I remember that there was very little communication from the police force who were involved. Um, and I, I can't find anything online. I'm not sure if anyone has actually been charged at all yet. Um, and that was four years ago. Wow. I just, yeah, I, these, like this apology, the fact that, I mean, that's horrible. I didn't know about that. And I think what is so horrifying about these deaths and I think people you know, people will say things like, oh, we're getting desensitized. I don't think black people are really getting desensitized to black death. We just are, you know, anyways, I don't feel desensitized when I hear stories like that. Um, but even though we're now getting, you know, now that police are willing to acknowledge or even apologize or whatever, sometimes, not all the time, we are still very, very far from holding police officers accountable for murder the way we hold other people accountable. And this gets into a whole nother conversation about like the criminal system in general and how, you know, both in here and in the United States and all of the things that need to change. Um, but um, we are still very, very, very far from cops being held criminally accountable, you know, because of how the system is set up. Um, it's yeah anyways that's really horrible i didn't know about that one and when you say because the how how the systems are set up do you mean like bluntly because it prioritizes white people like white lives over black lives i mean yeah i think there's so many there's so many things to say about this the broader both like the criminal you know I don't, I hesitate to call it the criminal justice system, but like the system of policing, of prisons, of surveillance, of, of punishment. I was listening to actually um, 
a podcast today that I can even send and maybe you can like link to this episode, but, um, you know, what Black Lives Matter globally is fighting for is an is abolition of all of it. And people get kind of squirmy when they hear that because it's, it's hard to imagine a world where we wouldn't have prisons and we wouldn't have police. Um, but I think for Black people and for abolitionists, why this is really the only option is because the system that currently exists says to us every single day, we can kill you, we can control your body, we can control your movement, we can pull you over and not tell you what we're doing or why, and we can lock you up forever just because, because we can. And for abolitionists and for people who like operate within this framework, it's not asking you to say, let's get rid of prisons. It's asking you to say, imagine a system where we treat all people with humanity. And people who say, well, I can't imagine a world without prisons or without police. What you're saying to me is I can't imagine a world where everybody is seen as a human being. That's what you're saying to me. Because right now the system that might work for you, the police that might make you feel safe to another group of people all they feel and associate with those systems is death, their family members being taken away, and not having control of their body or their movement or being pulled over no matter what they do. And is that a world that you want to live in? Are you going to fight to uphold a system when there are people telling you, showing you that it was never meant to work for them? You know? So I think there's so many, like, there's so many ways you can get into the nitty gritty of what it actually looks like. But for me, it's like so much more on like a philosophical, like principled level of like, what type of world do you want to live in? Think about the family of that, of, of these people, of that guy you were just talking about. Do you think they're two years removed, able to talk about it and be like, yeah, well, he got killed by police and we never got anything for it. And they never even acknowledged that they did anything wrong. And they're not over that. That family is living with that forever. The black community is living with these with these deaths that are just unanswered for, you know, it's like painful. Like the only option we have is to reimagine something, something new. It's the only choice we have, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that to hear you explain it in such like ob obvious terms and, um, with such, uh clarity over what the actual situation is that some people don't understand that there is a problem and in particular i'm talking about the relationship with the police and the, the police's harassment of the black community here and i had quite a challenging conversation with someone on twitter last night um around the bianca williams incident and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna read out a couple of his tweets. They're not particularly like incendiary. There's nothing like um, that I wouldn't want to repeat. But he um, he basically replied to a screenshot that I posted of um, an ex professional rugby player here in the UK who said um, he said if you're stopped by the police, whoever you are, and you think you've done nothing wrong, why don't people just comply with what the police are asking them? i.e. the police are doing their job and then move on and um i posted that because i thought it was quite an interesting view uh, and someone replied and said what is wrong with that statement and he then said why do people unnecessarily kick off when stopped by police oh that's right it's because they've got something to hide and I, with like everything that's been happening recently and everything that's been in the, the UK press, the US press, every, you know, everything that's happened, I was just like, quite, I, it's kind of stopped me in my tracks. And, but it was actually quite a good reminder that a lot of people still think like that. And so what would you say to someone like, and this goes out to everyone, like what, what would you say to someone who says, you know, I don't, I don't get, like, what's wrong with that statement? Why do people unnecessarily kick off when they're stopped by police? 
<laughs> Melzi? It's, it's a difficult one to try and explain to someone that has them views. It's so difficult because it's, it's that age old saying, you know, you, you can't, you know, you don't know what a person's been through until you've walked, stepped, walked in their shoes, a mile in their shoes or whatever. And for us as, as, as black people, we know when you have, when you are stopped and I, I've been stopped, you know, many times by the police, you know, the tone that they're coming with is different. You know, the aggression that they're coming with is different. It's not about them just doing their job. It's, 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 it's the same thing as what happened to Bianca. It's, it's excuses to stop you. Like Havana said, because they can, because they can. And you are made to feel like a criminal. You're made to feel like you've done something wrong. And why should you have to feel like that if they're just doing their job, if they're coming from a place of being genuine, if they're coming from a place of honesty? You don't feel that. And until you're in that situation yourself and you go through that experience yourself, it, you're, you're not going to understand. But this is what we're trying to fight for. We're trying to change those viewpoints of people. And that, that, for me, that sounds like someone who believes that we live in a, a, um, a, a country or a world which is completely equal. That's what it sounds like. It's like, well, if everyone's just going to, if everyone just complies, everyone gets stopped, the police are going to stop everyone. No, no, that's, not how, that's not what's happening, though. We're hearing about deaths in police custody. We're hearing about numerous amounts of black people being stopped with no legitimate reason. How many videos and, and, and different articles have I sent you since we started this? It's been loads. It's, it's not just one person. It's not just two people. It's thousands of people that this is happening to. And this can't just be routine stop. There's a problem with that. And look, people have their opinions and they're entitled to that. This is a, you know, they can have that. But this is what we're trying to fight for, basically. It's difficult to explain, but that is what you're, that's what you're trying to fight for. And this is why you, you're consistently banging your head against the wall sometimes. You feel like you're doing that because when people come up with them statements, it's just like, well, it's not, we, we need to do more now, don't we? We need to, the conversation needs to keep happening clearly. For me, it's always confusing too that like people like unless someone is actually just like straight up a narcissist, it's like it's just asking someone for one second to consider that someone else's experience might not be the same as theirs. Exactly what Danny said. That's the first thing I'll say is like this is what you learn in like kindergarten. Like it's not always about you. Anyways, the other thing I'll say is, you know, about this comply thing. Um, one, even if you don't comply with the police, that's not an excuse for them to kill you. And there are plenty of white people who don't comply with the police and who don't die. There are plenty of white people who break the law and do horrible things and are not murdered by police because that's not how the law works. And that's not right, right? Like we, even if I go in, run up and punch someone in the face and go up and punch a cop in the nuts, like that's not a reason for them to kill me. It's not. That's not a punishable offense by death, one. Second thing I'll say is no other group of people in the world have their deaths broadcasted and made viral the way that black people do. So for someone who says that about comply, complying, I would, and I don't, I don't recommend this for a lot of reasons, but I'll say it in this sense, in this instance. Um, go watch, go on YouTube, and watch 20 videos in a row of black people being killed by police. And because you can, and you can't watch that. You can't watch white people. You can't watch indigenous people. You can't watch, and not that other people don't experience violence, but other, other groups don't experience violence publicly in this way. And go see how many views those videos have. Everyone around the world is watching black people being killed by police officers, knowing that those police officers are facing no punishment, and no recourse, maybe paid leave. I don't recommend doing this because I think it's traumatic. And also it makes you think that, you know, it desensitizes you or makes you think that black people being violently killed is like a normal thing and it's not. But in all of those videos, whether or not people are complying, if you're a black person and you're watching all of those, what do you think is going to be your reaction when you see a police officer? 
If you watch a video of a monster killing somebody 50 times, and then you see that monster walking towards you, what do you think you're going to do? Run. Run. Because there are videos of people of not complying, and they get killed. There are video people, videos of people complying, and they get killed. There are videos of people who aren't given a choice whether or not to comply. So this argument is like, this, this is the reason I'm getting so fired up. These are conversations that I intentionally don't have because these are conversations that like white people need to have with other white people. Because even asking a black person to justify their humanity to you is racist. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. And I just don't have the energy for it. I, you know, we have bigger fish to fry. People in our communities are literally being killed. You know, since BLM has started, Black people have died in police custody in the UK. So like we're, you know, we're on bigger, we're making bigger moves than convincing the white man on Twitter. And I hope this guy is listening. I don't know if he's white. I hope whoever this is, is listening is like, whether or not you think that black people deserve to die when they don't comply is a mood point to me because they're dying anyways. And you need to come around, man, on Twitter eventually and realize what the problem is. But like, this is a movement and it's moving with or without you, you know? So you got to get on board or you got to get out of the way and stop espousing racist shit on Twitter, you know? Like, you know, anyways, this, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really, it's messed up. There's so many, but there's so many things I could say. And there's so many ways you could respond to this conversation. But my stock answer is like, I guess I'll say this last thing. I'm talking so much, but this is the last thing I'll say. The reason George Floyd sparked such an incredible response, you know, built on, you know, the Ahmaud Arbery shooting and all these other shootings in the US is that that video is so horrifying. And it's so clear that it, it, ha it had to be the perfect storm of showing someone who was truly helpless and died anyways. And like Danny said earlier, how many videos or things that are just not recorded are we not seeing, you know, where some, we're, we're not assured and made certain of that person's absolute innocence in their death to make it seem like it's worth our, our caring, you know? Are we really in a place where someone has to be so supremely innocent in their dying, in their death, for us to care about it? That sucks. I don't want to feel that way. I don't feel like I'm perfect and I'm defined, you know, I've ever been defined by the worst thing I've ever done. You know, are you, are you guys, have you been killed for the illegal shit you've done? I've done a lot of illegal things, not a lot, but like, you know, what are we, like how, anyways, I could talk about this for a long time, but those are my initial thoughts. And I hope this, I hope homeboy is listening, whoever tweeted these things, because I think it's important that he hears this. Uh, thank you both for those points. I think it's really quite an emotive topic to speak about. And hearing you both speak about it is, again, kind of makes me astounded, but maybe I shouldn't be so surprised that the kind of traction that we've seen over here, like since George Floyd's murder, how did that not lead to conversations like in every police department in this country where they sat down with their officers and said, you know what, there is clearly a demographic in this country that feels victimized and discriminated against by the police force. Let's maybe not be as heavy handed as we have done in the past. But yet, as Milzy says, like on our WhatsApp group, literally every day, every few days, there is another story in this country. Like before Bianca Williams, it was a father and his son who were doing a charity cycle and got pulled over by police on a canal path cycling because they matched the description of uh, a murderer in the area. And did they get an apology? No, because the dad wasn't in the public eye and because it wasn't recorded. And like you both point out, all of these instances that go under the radar because they are not recorded, like where's the justice for all of them? Where's the apology for all of them? And not only is it 
really dispiriting to think that like the police aren't changing their mindset on this but also that people in the public are so willing to comply with that mindset and i think that's what's coming up in this twitter comment that you've raised ben is that people are so reluctant to think that there might be a better fairer way of the how this stuff all operates because clearly it isn't operating well at the moment and people want to stand by it and think just because they've always complied when the police have pulled them over for one reason or another like guarantee that guy's experiences with the police are nothing like the ones we've just talked about or either of yours and yeah i think that i don't know how that point can be communicated to this particular individual i hope he's listening to this because you know he'd have to be incredibly ignorant to not <laughs> uh hear something in it but yeah i think that's that's to me what's coming out in this is that there needs to be institutional change but there needs to be a sort of wholesale communal social change between the way people look at these institutions that kind of leads me on to um what i wanted to ask next actually uh so if we're talking about police harassment how one how how does it change H how does it how do we put an end to it or how does an, how is an end put to it and two how can the person who is listening to this now have any sort of impact on any progress towards that change are those are those questions too broad or are there ways in which you can move so you can impact that so. yeah i mean i think that question is broad but like i think it's i think what i'm really leaning into in this moment is like this the reality of our systems and how they all interact with each other is messy and complex and confusing and there's not a single answer um people often want to say, you know, when you offer critiques, like, okay, yeah, well then what's the solution? It's like, well, when, whenever in the history of anything important has one person had the one answer that fixes everything, like this is an ongoing problem and critiques are helpful, are part of the process. So um, I think, you know, Hugo, to your point, like why are these conversations not happening in police departments? Um, you know, in a United States context, and I'm, and I'm sure, you know, from what I've seen and experienced here is like, you know, part of the reason that these communities are so overly heavily policed is because of just like the fact that there are, the way police operate in black and brown neighborhoods or poor neighborhoods are different because, you know, a lot of the crimes that people are engaging in are crimes of poverty you know, our crimes of like, you know, you know, if you grow up in a community for generations that has had poor funding and education systems, um, poor access to healthcare, um, in a COVID pandemic, two of your parents die, you know, you have, you're more impacted by economic crashes by, because of like the racism in all of our structures that all compound in one area or on one person, if you consider all the things that might lead somebody to commit a crime or once they commit a crime because our system isn't interested our systems aren't interested in rehabilitating people but punishing people like in america you commit a crime and you go to prison you get out and you're on parole you can't vote you have court fines and fees your your ability to re-enter society is limited as part of your punishment that's not restorative that's not helpful the systems you know, people say a lot like our system is broken, our criminal justice system is broken. Our criminal justice system works really well at doing what it's intended to do, which is punish people. Punish people and surveil them and keep them attached to the system. So the reason police departments, I think, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think every police officer is a bad person, but they operate in a system where they come into work every day and say, oh, we have these black kids engaging in knife crime and we have this neighborhood that has all this crime in it, you know, the focus of those police officers is identifying the individual perpetrators of those crimes, things that are criminalized. You know, that's another conversation. What do we even consider crime, crimes? 
um, they're not necessarily thinking about addressing the harm in the community that might lead to all of those things that make people commit crimes because that's not what they're trained to do. Police officers aren't social workers. Police officers aren't teachers and educ educators. Police officers are first responders to, to crime, to individuals. Let's grab the individual who's committing the crime and remove them and it'll make it better. What we know now from years and years and years of like experience and academia and scholarship is when you remove just the person, not only doesn't fix the problem, it makes it worse. You're taking that person away from their family. You're traumatizing those kids who lose their parent. You're, you're reinforcing that people shouldn't be accountable for the things they do, but they should hide them away because they'll get punished for it. Um, you know, when you're thinking about like, we want to divest from police or, you know, all these terms that Black Lives Matter is using, what we're saying is we want to take money away from people and police and prisons that aren't helping our communities and put them into things that do help communities. You know, if you're engaging in, you know, domestic violence work and education for kids and um, food accessibility for poor people, housing for people who are homeless. You're engaging in abolition work because you're investing in parts of the society that right now the only thing we have to handle is police and punishment. You know, like, so this, pro this question, Ben, isn't too broad because the answers are numerous. There's so many ways you can get involved. If you want to get involved by helping your community do that, if you want to get involved by you know, going to your, go, you know, going, you know, if you have police in your neighborhood, going around your neighborhood and being like, do we need all these police here? Sign this petition. Let's get them out of our neighborhood and let's invest in something else that keeps our community safer. If we have mental health crises in our community, let's invest in, in mental health services and community centers. If we have a bunch of homeless kids and folks in our neighborhood, let's get them housing. You know, like there are so many different ways that are going to be hard, that are complicated, that require more people being educated on these things. You know, I learned today that there are like, like what, like 140 black academics in the UK of like the thousands. You know, you need more people at the upper echelons of these institutions creating the knowledge and the research. Um, yeah, it has to happen at all levels all at once. But I think the first thing is just acknowledging that like, it's not that we think police are bad. Police are ill-equipped to deal with the problems that we have in our society. And if we're only dealing with problems by punishing people, you know, what does that say about what type of society we live in? You know, like people who have kids know you can't just punish a kid, punish, 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 and they stop doing it. You have to teach them, help them, help them grow, rehabilitate them. Um, the communities that these cops are going into and are so afraid of and are, would get better if they just like were there less and the money that paid them to be there paid schools to keep these kids in school more and help them, you know, anyways, these are all random examples, but I think it's a, it's a big, it's a huge problem. So ask big questions, you know. Thanks for, uh, thanks for managing to give me an answer because I asked that and then realized how broad it was. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I know that our listeners will as well, because I think sometimes you kind of get a bit lost of how to actually have an impact. So I think a lot of people are learning a lot of the time and feeling really emotive and wanting to help and to progress um, everything that's happening at the moment, but you, you just don't know where to like focus your efforts. So I think that being aware that loads of different things, no matter how small can help, I think is probably a very useful thing to know. So thanks for like expressing that. Um, while you were talking, it reminded me of an ex-girlfriend of mine who, when I first met her, was training to be a police officer. Um, and as part of that, I'm not like particularly aware of like the intricacies of this, but as part of that, she would go out on patrol as like a special constable or something, I think the name is like, so you're not, you don't really have the responsibilities of an actual police officer, but it's kind of like you're shadowing someone, right? And she did it for like, quite a long, quite a long amount of time, actually, maybe like almost a, a year or something, quite a significant amount of time. And a couple of months after I met her, she ditched it because she said, from everything I've seen, and sh she started doing it because she wanted to help people. She wanted to 
help rehabilitate people, help re-educate people, help people who needed it. And she, she said, oh, I'm not doing it anymore because from what I've seen, we don't help anyone. We punish everyone. And she just immediately dropped it. And then she decided that she wanted to try and work as um, a psychiatric professional within a prison. So she went down that route. She did a master's in psychology, I think, clinical psychology. Uh, and then as part of that, she did work experience in a prison. And within a few visits, she realized exactly the same thing. Like no one was being supported. No one was being helped. They were, they were still being punished. Like, and yeah, that, that experience for her just brought it home that she didn't really find any sort of avenue in which she could help rehabilitate people who needed it to help support people who needed it. And so she ended up just feeling totally lost and she, she left, she left all of that behind. And I think like, like now she works in a completely different industry like, and this is years later now, but she, she tried and there was nothing in place that would allow her to have any sort of positive impact. And I think that's where you realize how systemic the issues are where she's tried different, she's tried policing. She's tried what's supposed to be, you know, a rehabilitative experience in a prison setting and, and neither allowed her to, to fulfill her want to help people. That's kind of me just explaining an experience. It's not really a question to be honest, but. No, but I think that's valuable. I think, um, you know, as, is, is this person white who you're talking about? Yeah. So I think like, especially for white people in this moment, um, you know, regardless of class and regardless of all of these things that undergird it, her experience as someone, especially someone with, uh, with white privilege moving through those spaces is really valuable. And for other people listening and wondering what they can do, tell that story and get with other people and figure out ways that you can apply, you know, apply pressure to like the higher ups and the institutions and the structures. And I also think, you know, something that's valuable that this story made me think about Ben is like the people often in those positions and those, in those care, care, maybe not police officers, but like psychiatric care and, and for, and caring for people who are at the fringes of our society that we've like shucked away and hid away because we don't know how to deal with them. So we just lock them up. The people that end up caring for those people tend to be women. And, and people of color, um, overwhelmingly. And those positions, as we figure out how we're changing our system, are critically important. We need good people and people willing to do the work at every single level. And um, the reason it tends to be but women and people of color is because they are not given the choice whether or not to care about these populations because these are their their kids, their brothers, their partners, their, you know, their, you know, not that men aren't put in that same position, but care work in general, you know, is like left to the people that also are most oppressed in our society. So I think getting people in there that even when they realize there's not much they can do from those positions, staying and doing that work, because if they're not doing it, someone else is. Um, but yeah, I hear you like, you know, on the on the ground frontline work, which are the social workers, the caregivers, the teachers, the, that work is tiring and it's tiring for a reason. And we need that work, that work happening, you know, while we're changing, changing the systems. I think that follows on quite nicely actually to um, sort of another question that we all had really. And just getting uh, some of your personal experiences um, you know, as a, as a mixed race woman um, in America and in the UK, what your own personal experiences have been with racism, but also as a woman as well. This is, you know, you're the first woman that we've had on the show. Um, and we, you know, it's so important that you have a voice to, 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 to share your, your, um, your experiences and what you feel needs to change, not necessarily only for you know, black people, but for black women as well, or um, a, woman, a black woman of color. Mm. 
thank you for that question. And yeah, <laughs> so many things I could say, but thank you for that question. And I, and I like, I'm, you know, I'm really glad to be on the show. And I also am, I'm so sad that I'm the first, but I think, you know, gotta start somewhere. I think with the Dulwich team, um, you know, for anyone listening, like come and support us and come to our games. Like we work really, really hard and, and really just love the game. I think, um, actually one of my teammates who, um, works for, works with you, Ben, um, Salon, I'm thinking of, I've learned a lot from her just about, um, you know, it's just, I'm going to talk specifically about football right now, but like, just about how, even as someone in the women's game and as a female athlete, I've always measured up my, my athleticism and my sport to the men's game. And that in itself is like such an oppressed way of thinking because the women's game um, is different. You know, it stands on its own. It is, it is. um, And I think people who are like true fans of the women's game will hear me on this is like, we've always been as female athletes measuring ourselves up against a standard that is now just blindly accepted as like truth, like men's football is bigger, faster, stronger, and therefore better. Um, and I'm just now like being on, on Dulwich and, and, and playing with these women, like really just like ha- growing in my appreciation for like the women's game, you know, watching the women's world cup last year, like, women are, sorry, my, my housemate is talking, if you can hear the background, but, um, just like, it's such a, it's just like such a dope time, even with all of the BS that people still spout, like, it's a dope time to be a female athlete, like, it's a dope time to be a women's footballer, and I just, like, am, like, I love it, I love it, and so I hope that people will come out and support us, and watch us, and, be a fan the same way they support the men's team because like we're part of you know we're part of this club and and we're so proud you know we're so proud to be like I've I've only been on this team for six months eight months there are women that have been on this team for years like this is who they are so come come meet us and know us in terms of like my personal experience I feel like you know, growing up, growing up mixed race in the States, I think I very much still identify with being black, which I'm learning here is kind of like a different dynamic, like mixed race people here, maybe sometimes feel like they can't identify with either. And they're more like, you know, put into this box of being specifically mixed. I very much identified with being black, even though I grew up in mostly white spaces and white schools and playing a very white sport, like soccer in the States is very, very white more, I think even more so than it is here in a lot of ways. Um, And, um, I think I very much came into my understanding of like wanting to be engaged with issues of race and social justice through my sport. Um, you know, getting involved with like student movements on campus when I was a student athlete at at the University of Washington in Seattle and, um, really just like come, you know, we talked about this a bit earlier in the episode, but like coming into like my, this realization that like what what power you have as an athlete um, to like use a platform to just like say, to say something and to be heard and have people listen to you. And um, so that was really dope. I think coming here, um, and you can let me know, Danny, if I'm missing any part of this question, but I think for me, you know, my experience with racism, I think a lot of times like, well, one, one thing I noticed here, and I'll say this because it might be important for people to hear like, saying white people or calling white people white people in the states is like an okay thing to do and i've noticed here like i'm doing a master's program here and like even in like school like saying white people a lot or calling white people white people is like (gasps) more of a thing and like in the states it's like fine to do that or like at least like in academic spaces especially like it's not as like taboo And I think that kind of speaks to a larger observation that I've had and like in talking to friends have really like just realized is like um, talking about racism here or like engaging with racism or um, it's, it's more like kind of um, it's not, it's not less than, and it's not worse or better. It's just like more, it's, it's harder to talk about 
everyone's like kind of, I think a bit more concerned here with like saying the wrong thing, you know, or if they get called out, they're really like, so it's, it's like this, it's harder to engage with, um, in my, in my master's program right now, even with our professors who are sociologists who study race and study class, um, have a hard time just like personally engaging with it. Um, and because it's never fully, that topics, certain topics or race in general is never like fully laid down on the table. It's hard to then pick at it. Whereas in the U S in my experience in academic settings, especially like we just, we just talk about it and get to the point. And, um, which again, yeah, has just been a really interesting experience. I'll, I'll, I'll say this too. Like, so in terms of just racism, I think my experiences with racism have very rarely, if ever been like overt, you know, explicit, like name calling, violent, you know, I've been profiled, you know, like pulled over, you know, in my mom's beater car when we were kids or whatever. Um, but for me, I think now the type of racism that I think is sometimes hard for white people to wrap their head around is, is, is the ignorance in realizing like what even is hurtful or problematic, like the, you know, even the question of like, well, why don't people just comply? You know, that's not a malicious thing to ask. It's not coming from a place of, of hurt or of like malice. Um, but that to me is like, the most extreme form of racism that I experience is like, why do, why do Black Lives Matter? You know, like these things, these, these questions that insinuate this, you know, it's, it's more about like what's not there. The consideration that's not given to me is like, is, is a form of racism that I really like, I really struggle with because I often react you know, angrily or frustrated, or I get, or I cry or I get sad or I get hurt or I, you know, having to figure out how to like constantly respond and police my own behavior so that I'm heard by white people is like this, this experience that I'm trying to figure out how to negotiate that's different here than it is in the U.S. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if I fully answered your question, but kind of just like figuring out how to exist here and care about the things I care about and talk about the things I talk about and not always feel like I have to justify to people, you know, why not killing black people is important. Yeah, and it's funny that you, it's not funny, it's the wrong word. It's interesting that you um, say that white British people feel a bit uh, ooh, <laughs> uncomfortable about talking about race because that's exactly what we spoke about uh, in an episode a couple of weeks ago. And Hugo summed it up like, we are uncomfortable about talking about it because we so rarely have to talk about the color of our skin. And we, we very rarely talk about ourselves as white people. And Hugo said that the only time that you ever really remember, or like the only time you ever have to specify the color of your skin is when you're filling in a questionnaire, right? To, to specify your ethnicity. And so then, because it's such an untouched subject for us, it means that we don't know how to tread. Like we don't, we don't, we don't feel, it's not comfortable ground for us at all. And it's interesting that you say that there seems to be more of an indifference from British white people towards racism than there is in the States where it's like an active conversation. Whereas here it's frustrating because there's just total indifference and a kind of like, huh? Like why? Which I can, I can, you know, I can hear from your, what you just said and I can imagine it's, it's so frustrating because it's not even a conversation. Like at least in the States, it's a conversation, right? It's a, it's a really fucking difficult one, like horrendous, but it is a conversation. But here it isn't. Maybe until the last few months. Yeah, yeah and I think, I don't wanna, yeah, I think it, it, I hear what you're saying. And I think something that I need to be careful of not doing that I've done, you know, in this past year in my studies is like in making this comparison to say that 
the issues aren't as bad here or that people aren't saying this shit here too. Like black people here, like one thing I love, like being black here is also really, really dope and really fun. And um, that's another thing, like in just talking about all of this, like sometimes we forget that like black people don't only think about like hard shit and racism and sorry, I'm cursing, but like being black is also like really fun and really awesome. And being black here, like being black in London is so fun. And I, and I, I've loved it. It's like been one of my favorite things about being here is, is tapping with the black community and meeting people. And, you know, like black people here are like saying this stuff. They're saying the same stuff we're saying in the U S not just because we're saying it there because, but because the problems exist here, obviously that's what we're talking about. And, um, you know, the issues of racism and like inequality and how they're structured and layered are just like, they're almost too complex to even compare really. Like the experiences that black people have here, how, how immigration and race and class all overlay here, the histories are so different. So it's almost not even really worth it to try to compare all the time. But, um, yeah, I do think there's just like, you know, a need to like get over the discomfort of like being wrong or saying the wrong thing or being polite or being, or having the right etiquette. It's like, sometimes you just need to, maybe that's in, you know, it's a both a blessing and a curse of Americans is they're just like, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, black people are saying, saying it, they're doing the work. People just need to listen. It's, uh, that's the quote there. <laughs> that sums it up. Um, I think that's probably a good place for us to wrap up. Um, thank you for your time. It's been amazingly insightful. And I think this used is the, this word is used a lot and sometimes it's not particularly applicable, but genuinely hearing you speak is inspirational and it's been, it's been so interesting to have this conversation with you and it's, it's been as valuable as I think we all expected. So thank you so much for your time. And I hope, I hope you found it useful yourself um, in some way. So yeah, thanks man. It's been really cool. Thank you guys. Yeah. I really, really enjoyed it. And yeah, it, it has been hugely helpful and it's, and it's, it was good to meet you Ben the other day, Danny, it's so good to meet you. And he was like, yeah, I, I appreciate you guys. And I'm always, I'm always down for the conversation for sure. No, definitely. I think as well as a, as a, as a black man as well, I just want to say a personal thank you to you as well. Um, to have a, you know, a woman on here as um, you know, a mixed race woman on here. Like I said, it's the first time we've had a woman on, in, in, on the series. It's great to hear your opinion, the way you speak, your 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 views is um like ben said it's, it's inspirational and i think f for this show it's just going to add a, a complete dynamic different dynamic to what we've been doing um and yeah just just thank you so much and yeah it's, it's been really good really good it's everything i thought it was going to be and more <laughs> thanks yeah i also would want to echo my thanks and um just say yeah how, how proud I am to to call you a friend and um someone who represents Dalit Shamlet. Um and yeah, excited to to see where you can continue to take this conversation and your activism and also where you take it with with the team on the pitch next season. Uh, um yeah, thank you so much for coming on and uh of course, guys taking oh, the time out to, to speak with us. Yeah, Thanks, I, thank you guys so so much i really appreciate it lads do you want to stay on the line just for 10 minutes so we can have a catch up and um yeah, yeah cool thanks to havana uh, yeah, and, thanks, uh guys. enjoy your evening thanks guys take care take care yeah, chat to you. okay cool talk to you soon bye, -bye. Cheers, bye. bye.